So the Material Genome Initiative is uh, an initiative launched by President Obama in June to accelerate the pace at which we get new materials to market. Uh, we believe we can do it at half the speed, or I'm sorry, twice the speed, at half the cost. And that's what we're, what we're trying to get done. And there are four key priorities for us right now. One is um, promoting open paradigms. That's both on the computation and the data. The second is developing these ecosystems where all stakeholders in the value chain could gain access to the initiative and the outputs of the initiative. So for example, small and medium-sized business to get access to computational tools that are developed as part of the infrastructure. The third is on really driving new innovation and new techniques in the infrastructure itself. So it's not just enough to say we're going to promote computation and data sharing, etc. It's, it's really necessary for us to, to move the needle and figure out new techniques and new innovative ways of predicting material behavior or leveraging open paradigms for data sharing or developing new characterization technique. We want to be on the leading edge of that. Four is on a culture shift. So we are looking at um, how do you move the community to think differently about how they do their business? And that is both in terms of interacting with tools and data in a fundamentally new way, but also viewing themselves not as individual principal investigators, but rather as part of a broader ecosystem of contributors to, to move this forward. So there's a cultural barrier that uh, we're going to have to deal with. You're already starting to see progress. We've established a new interagency working group that's formalized under the National Science and Technology Council. We are looking at developing new activity around the policy objectives I mentioned. We have four federal agencies with funding opportunities on the street today, and this is pending fiscal year 12 budget appropriation, but uh, these, we're seen as these agencies getting creative in terms of getting something started. We just want to get the momentum going. Mm -hmm. Professional societies are going to play a fundamentally uh, important role in that we cannot scale without them. Uh, the materials community is by definition fragmented and interdisciplinary. You have over a dozen different professional societies, not one go-to place. So what that means to us is that um, instead of trying to force a monolithic initiative where we push everyone together, we're going to work with the system we have. These types of initiatives tend to take a life of their own. So. Uh, what, what we don't do is prescribe to the professional societies what they should and shouldn't be doing. Uh, we're very excited when there's a workshop being hosted here at this ms and meeting, MRS, forthcoming you know, couple months. So those are the types of activities that we expect to see in the beginning because they're beginning the dialogue. It's less important that we answer the questions and get firm commitments right now than just communicating what our objectives are and why we've chosen to go down this road. What you'll notice hap what will happen most likely over the next year or two, we're going to move from this outbound communication to more of a directed, more tangible set of milestones. And this is going to happen organically. Every professional society will figure out what their appropriate role is. The initiative is uh, may, it is very broad mm -hmm. in scope. So we're not talking about solving a specific problem. There are a dozen particular issues that we're trying to resolve. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to do that under the guidance of the materials genome, which basically means under the guidance of the president and the administration. Mm -hmm. what, what may work for data, for example, or for computation or for an ICME approach um, may not work for the experimental piece or for defining national priorities or accelerating our next generation workforce. Mm -hmm. So we're open to many different models. Okay. Um, this isn't strictly uh, a consortium model alone, but I imagine that there's a consortium model that will play a piece of this, okay. this entire initiative. So this is how you break it in manageable chunks. You have to consider that there are many, many different material categories and they don't all necessarily coexist in the same vernacular or space, however you want to define it. Mm -hmm. So we need a, 
initiative that will promote the advancement of all of them. So out of the gate, you're already looking at doing things in a very distributed way. The idea that you could have clusters of different activity that are specifically targeting new material solutions, like if you're looking at batteries or new protective gear for the military, or you're looking at new alloys for space flight. All of this can be achieved by focusing efforts on the individual clusters, the ecosystems that target those today, those material problems today, and allow them to, to run the experiment, to think about how all the components of the Materials Genome Initiative can be used to accelerate their own work. Okay. Now if you have this distributed network of dozens and dozens of clusters, you could potentially bring together some of the common pieces, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But we don't have all the answers. We're, we're, you know, we are very open to thinking through what's going to work best for the community. A polymer scientist may be different than an alloy engineer and may have different needs for data and computation and quite honestly may never have a need to interact. But um, you know, this is a sort of the umbrella initiative to bring them together. So NanoHub was a, an example, uh, a program run out of Purdue University with the support of the National Science Foundation. NanoHub was a repository for, and is, for code, for software, first principle calculations, density functional theorem calculations, you name it, they're up there. And it's open to the public, so anybody can run this code if, if they have a little bit of insight in terms of how they use it and what it can be used for. What was really, truly remarkable, I think, about this program was the ripple effect that it had in the community. So now you had folks that normally would have shelved their code. Their code served a certain purpose, a publication was made, a postdoctoral student left, a graduate student graduated, and that code is on a hard disk on a computer that's in a basement in some university. Well, NanoHub changed that. They now created incentives for that postdoc, that grad student, to continue working on the code and maintain it. Why? Because now that their code is being out there in the public, as individuals use it, it benefits the community, but it also benefits them. They get that counted towards tenure or publication citations, so on and so forth. So it's truly remarkable what an open system may allow, open access in this case, for uh, software and for um, you know, any type of first principle calculation. Let me make one other point about software. You know, we have a tendency to, to value analytic and physical experimental tools um, maybe more than we are valuing computational tools. And what this does is we create major user facilities nano facilities, et cetera, for experimental work. But we don't have the equivalent for s s computation. And in many ways, the computation software, the tools that are developed, need software discipline. And software discipline includes user interface, it includes maintenance, it includes all the elements that make a company like Microsoft successful at delivering their software. We need to replicate that level of support, and that's what this initiative is, is targeted at doing. And you mentioned uh, global competitiveness, and we're talking about using the federal government, U.S. dollars, to kind of develop an open infrastructure. Openness seems to be a big part of it. So how do we protect U.S. competitiveness um, in such an open kind of framework? Well, okay, well look, so there's going to be a necessary involvement in the, the global community in this. This is a U.S.-based initiative. Mm -hmm. So whatever the guidelines are of the federal funding, whether foreign entities can compete for that funding or not, it would be unusual if they could, but there may be some cases they can. Uh, but why wouldn't we look to them to share best practices in data and computation, in um, the actual structures? How, how much information is embodied in the data? You can give me a database and I can give that database 10 different people and they'll read it 10 different ways. In some ways the analytic tools that mine that data for information is more important. 
the, the discipline of how we process materials, the know-how of how we process materials, how we manufacture those materials at scale, that's where a lot of the intellectual property exists. We may overstate how uh, we're going to work with international um, collaborators and our fear that maybe we can't retain that competitiveness. I mean, look, if you're going to grow a new workforce, it's going to take a generation. But once you do, and they're equipped with these tools and this way of thinking, this culture of how they do materials work, well then, you can't, you can't easily lose that expertise unless you start exporting those individuals overseas. Yeah. So every administration has their own priorities. Right. Okay. Um, this is a priority of this administration, and I can't forward predict what the priorities will be of other administrations. What I can tell you is it's, it's a pretty obvious connection that advanced materials are going to play in our economic interests. So to whatever extent a future administration has an emphasis on the nation's national security and economic interests, advanced materials won't be far behind. We have established a formal NSTC process that will last into the next administration. So th these will sort of fluctuate, as I had mentioned, but the, it's unlikely that we close shop on this just because a new administration comes in. This isn't one of those um, pet type of pet projects. This is not just about uh, the administration, about the federal government. The federal government's a small player. Mm -hmm. we, we may start this and kick it off, but if we don't get the traction and the momentum with the private sector, who stands to benefit perhaps the most from this initiative, uh, then there's only so much we can do. Where would you like to be with this in a year? Well, you we're going to need a little bit more time to measure <laughs> success. So I'd say that from our perspective, success will look like a well-functioning interagency activity uh, well-coordinated funding opportunities put out by the federal government and a significant level of investment and participation from external stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So in a year we may be able to say we have a bit more of a roadmap for how we're going to achieve these results. I would like us to look back in 10 years and recognize the government played an a role in nucleating uh, a new effort in the materials community that may not have been possible without federal mm -hmm. support, but also the federal support ended up being a fraction, maybe 10 to 20 percent of the overall support that went into making this a reality. This is an all hands on deck initiative. We cannot do it alone. We cannot do it strictly waiting for the federal government to provide grants for one-offs here and there. We need the actual community rallying behind this, and we're starting to see that happen. So the community and the government are going to be on the same side of the line. If we don't do this, we are going to have a more difficult time in the global marketplace maintaining a competitive advantage. You know, a lot of folks are scrambling now to think through how we recover our manufacturing sector in the United States. Well, this is a way to do it with advanced materials, and for most people who out there who look forward, advanced materials are going to be the bedrock of the 21st century economies. Mm -hmm.